happen. You're all in for a treat this afternoon. Uh, in a few minutes, we're going to hear from Jack Chin. First, Dean Ammons has a few introductory remarks. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Professor Domino, uh, and welcome uh, to this event. Uh, for those of you who are here for the first time and may not know, let me just tell you a little bit about why we are here. This lecture series honors John Gaddett, one of the founders of the Harrisburg campus. He was the first vice dean on this campus and uh, who has subsequently served as a wonderful, wonderful mentor to every faculty member the school has hired. So for those of you who are my students in the audience, um, uh, mentoring takes place not only uh, among uh, teacher and student, but it continues as it should uh, throughout your career. So take advantage of the wonderful mentors you have here. And because of his uh, leadership. Um, uh, John, we can't thank you enough for what you've done through the years. And I know that a lot of that is possible because of your wonderful spouse, Carol, who is here uh, with you today. Thank you, Carol, for coming. And, and for those of you who don't know, I don't know if there's anybody in the audience who doesn't know, they are grandparents again uh, just this week or Saturday, um, a, 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 a young man. Uh, James Andrew, James Andrew, uh, c weighing in at six pounds and 10 ounces. And premature. And premature. I said, that's going to be a big boy. Uh, so we, we thank you for all that you've done uh, in so many ways, John and, and Carol. <clears throat> As you've heard, uh, this year's inaugural lecture, uh, this year's lecture is uh, being brought to us uh, by Professor Gabriel Jack Chin, who teaches at the University of California, Davis School of Law. Before um, Professor Domino comes back to the podium, let me take the prerogative and make just a couple of advertisements. Uh, in addition to this series today, for which you will receive CLE credit, those of you who are already members of the bar, there are a couple of other programs that are coming up. Uh, w uh, one um, on April 19th, um, Lisa Heiserling will be talking about clim climate change uh, at the EPA. And on April 24th at 4 o'clock, um, here on this campus, Patricia Slatkin who I believe is with the oh. Albany Law School um, Law and Government Program, is going to be talking about Beyond Environmental Review, Integrating Health Impact Assessment into Local Land Use Decision Planning. And last but not least, uh, there are CLE credits available, actually one CLE credit available, for a program on Monday, April 23rd at 2010 at from 3 to 3.30 to 4.30, there's a little cost for this one, but the uh, title of this program is Tips for Writing in a Crunch, and it is going to be presented by our legal writing professors. Uh, so I may have to sign up for that one myself. I'm always in a crunch. Well, again, I'd like to thank you for coming, and without any further ado, Professor Domino will come back to the podium. Thank you, Professor Chin, uh, Professor uh, Chin, for joining us today. I have a few additional thank yous and an advertisement of my own while we're taking prerogatives. Uh, I will be debating the individual mandate's constitutionality uh, a week from Thursday in the other building in the pit, so if you're interested in the case that's being argued this week before the Supreme Court, there will be a debate on that next week. A few thank yous. Uh, first, to Sandy Grafe, who has uh, taken such a uh, preeminent role in organizing the events here. Sandy, thank you. Uh, also, to Professor Wes Oliver, who was instrumental in instituting this lecture series five years ago. He is due a great deal of thanks. And to Aspen Publishers and the Walters Kluwer Law and Business, who have generously supported this lecture series from its inception that company is due uh, a great amount of thanks as well. 
we are the beneficiaries of a good deal of tradition with this lecture series, despite its relatively new nature. One of the traditions that we have associated with this lecture is that the lecturers have, from the beginning, signed the promotional brochures that are sent out to advertise the lecture. And we have collected those signatures and the messages that the lecturers have written into this binder, which we present every year to John Gedded. This year not being an exception, Jack Chin has, has graciously uh, written a remarks on, on the promotional brochures for today's lecture, and we'd like to present that to John. We also have, the, have flowers and chocolates for Carol, which we'd like to present to her at this time as well. One of the nice, nicest traditions that we have associated with this lecture series is that from its beginning, the people who have uh, graciously agreed to give the lectures have not only been leading scholars and dedicated teachers, but they have also been friends of individual members of this faculty. And the honor of introducing the lecturers then has gone not only to people who have heard of the lecturers by reputation, but who can speak to their personal characteristics as well. You can all read and have all read Jack's bio. And so you know that he teaches at the University of California, Davis. You may know that he has taught at the University of Arizona, the University of Cincinnati, the Western New England College of Law. You may know that he's one of the country's most influential scholars in immigration and race, of the law, race and the law. And you may know uh, what a stellar reputation he has for teaching. You probably do not know how nice a person he is personally. Since before I began teaching, Jack has been a mentor to me and has offered me great assistance in getting into this profession and succeeding once I've been able to enter it. And I am forever grateful to him for that. And to the rest of his family as well for being as nice as they have been to me and my family. Uh, his wife and his two daughters have been incredibly kind to, to us. We've visited him uh, out at his home. It's been uh, a wonderful experience all around because Jack is not only smart and accomplished and dedicated to his job, but he's also just an extraordinarily nice guy. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Jack Chin. I was uh, kind of hoping that those chocolates were for me, <laughs> but nevertheless, thank you so much, Dean Amons. Uh, thank, you, thank you so much, uh, Michael. I really appreciate that introduction, uh, and particularly to uh, uh, Dean and Mrs. Gedded, it's a real honor and pleasure to be here uh, and have the opportunity to talk with all of you today about uh, this, what to me is a very important topic. So uh, I, I want to talk about state regulation of immigration. Arizona, Alabama, and a number of other states following the lead of Hazleton, Pennsylvania, have taken steps through their own laws to deal with the presence of undocumented immigrants. Uh, the Supreme Court has granted certiorari to review the Arizona statute, SB 1070, and it's going to be argued on April 25th. My proposition to you is that there's nothing really fundamentally new with regard to these issues. All of the issues have come up before at the founding or in the expansion of federal authority following the Civil War. And if the Supreme Court follows its precedents, if it deals with these issues the same way it has dealt with them when they came up before, it will find that most of SB 1070 and most of the similar laws uh, are unconstitutional. Section 1 of SB 1070 makes clear what it's trying to accomplish. It says, 
the legislature declares that the intent of this act is to make attrition through enforcement the public policy of all state and local government agencies in Arizona. The provisions of this act are intended to work together to discourage and deter the unlawful entry and presence of aliens and economic activity by persons unlawfully present in the United States. And so SB 1070 and its siblings were designed to deal with what the framers, what the drafters of the act uh, saw as sort of impossible polarities. And so on the one hand, they knew that it was not likely at all that 11 or 12 million undocumented people in the United States were going to be formally apprehended, put in removal proceedings, and deported from the United States. Not going to happen. On the other hand, they thought that it was objectionable and undesirable for these 11 or 12 million people to be granted citizenship or some sort of legal status and allowed to stay. So they came up with what is an ingenious middle ground, uh, a set of policies that's designed to make it so difficult for undocumented people to live in the United States that they will self-deport and leave on their own without either of these uh, two policy options being required. So SB 1070, like its copycats, is a long statute that does a lot of different things. Uh, but I want to talk about the issues that the Supreme Court granted review on, the issues that are before the Supreme Court. The first is a requirement that every time the police lawfully stop, detain, or arrest an individual, and there's reasonable suspicion or probable cause that they're undocumented, that, that the police check with the federal government to determine if they are in fact lawfully or unlawfully in the United States. So, so everybody who's stopped, detained, and arre or arrested is going to have their status checked. Second is a provision allowing state and local police to make arrests for civil immigration violations. If somebody is, has not committed a crime necessarily, or they've committed a crime in the past that makes them removable, uh, uh, this SB 1070 says that they can be arrested by state police in Arizona for purposes of removing them from the United States. Now, under current law, the Supreme Court has held that any state and local law enforcement officer can make an arrest for a federal crime, including federal immigration crimes. So that's pretty much settled. Uh, but what this adds is civil deport deportability as opposed to an actual criminal immigration violation. The third provision that's at issue in the Supreme Court makes it an Arizona crime for an undocumented non-citizen to work in the state of Arizona. It's not a federal crime. It's not even illegal under federal law. But under SB 1070, it's an Arizona crime. And the last is a provision that makes it a crime for unauthorized migrants to be present in, the, in Arizona without having registered with the federal government. So there's a federal statute that says, if you come to the United States you, uh, and you're not a US citizen, you have to register. Obviously, people who illegally cross the border haven't registered. Uh, and it is a federal crime not to register. Now it's also an Arizona crime. So the US Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit held all four of those provisions unconstitutional. The first two by a two to one vote, the second two unanimously. Uh, and I'm most interested in the registration requirement, and another part of the law, which was not enjoined, that makes it an Arizona crime uh, to transport, conceal, harbor, or shield from detection an undocumented non-citizen. And what interests me about the registration requirement and the transportation, concealment, harbor, shielding provision is that if those provisions are constitutional, if Arizona and er any other state, for that matter, can pass those laws and enforce them with their own police and their own prosecutors and their own courts, then every state has the power to make simply being in the state a crime. Uh, that is, they have the power to force people to either self-deport or go to prison if they catch them. Supporters of the Arizona law say that the issue is implied preemption. Uh, 
that is the question about the validity of SB 1070 is did Congress intend to oust state authority over these areas? I think that's the wrong frame. I think that's the wrong question. When states get involved in immigration, my view is that the precedents make clear that, the, that it's not simply a question of whether there's a conflict between a specific provision of federal law and the state law. Instead, there's an affirmative state disability to regulate immigration. As the court explained in 1884, in language that could easily have been written today, this court has decided distinctly and frequently that the power of regulating immigration does not belong to the states. That decision did not rest in any case on the ground that the state and its people were not deeply interested in the existence and enforcement of such laws and were not capable of, of enforcing them if they had to, the power to enact them, but on the ground that the Constitution, in the division of powers which it declares between the states and the general government, has conferred this power on the latter to the exclusion of the former. In more recent times, the court has held that the power to regulate immigration is unquestionably exclusively a federal power. The core idea here is that when you're dealing with immigration, necessarily and intrinsically you're dealing with foreign policy and national security, and that has to be done at the federal level. One of the sort of problems in practice with state efforts to regulate immigration has been that they often do so, they're often moved to do so, when they're angry about something, when they're upset uh, at the behavior or conduct of another country, and that doesn't bode well for sort of measured, appropriate legislation. One of the big cases comes from 1876 in California, a case called Chai Lung versus Freeman, where California was trying to prevent Chinese from immigrating to the state. It wasn't legal or illegal under federal law in 1876, because in 1876 there was really no general federal immigration regulation. It was the era, the era of open borders, and federal law did not pr prohibit, at least, any number of people coming from anywhere uh, at any time. There simply wasn't federal regulation, and therefore there was no possibility of a conflict between state law and federal law regarding immigration because there was no federal law. So, so preemption per se was, uh, was not a possible basis to invalidate the California law, but even so, the Supreme Court said that the California law couldn't stand. They said, has the Constitution done so foolish a thing as to leave it in the power of the states to pass laws whose enforcement renders the general government liable to just reclamations which it must answer, while it does not prohibit to the states the acts for which it is held responsible? The Constitution of the United States is no such instrument. The passage of laws which concern the admission of citizens and subjects of foreign nations to our shores belongs to Congress and not to the states. The court said that the enforcement of immigration laws by state officials risked problems with foreign nations. A silly, an obstinate, or a wicked state immigration commissioner may bring disgrace upon the whole country, the enmity of a powerful nation, or the loss of an equally powerful friend. This understanding, I believe, remains robust in the modern cases. Take, for example, Plyler versus Doe, a 1982 decision which uh, dealt with a Texas statute that denied unauthorized migrant children access to public schools. It said they couldn't uh, uh, have free K through 12 public education. Uh, that was struck down five to four. The majority said the state has no direct interest in controlling immigration into this country, that interest being one reserved by the Constitution to the federal government. Uh, what interests me about Plyler versus Doe is that four justices, Berger, White, Rehnquist, and O'Connor, said that the states could exclude the children from public school. That was within their authority. But they agreed on the immigration point. They said, a state has no power to prevent unlawful immigration and no power to deport illegal aliens. Those powers are reserved exclusively to Congress and the executive. So on that issue, it was unanimous. So that leads to the question of what is a regulation of immigration? 
the court has de defined regulation of immigration as determining who can come and who must leave and the terms upon which lawfully admitted aliens can stay. That definition clearly leaves room for some discrimination against undocumented non-citizens. So in the Whiting case, for example, last term, the Supreme Court, five to four, held that states can deny undocumented non-citizens the ability to work. And such things as state denial of driver's licenses, uh, denial of access to higher education, denial of the right to possess firearms, I don't think that those are regulations of immigration per se, uh, and they have to stand or fall based on preemption principles. But regulating immigration itself is for the federal government. My uh, proposal, my view, is that determining who can come and who has to leave includes procedural aspects as well as substantive aspects. Uh, what I mean by that is that if we imagine North Dakota, uh, scrupulously followed federal standards. They want to have a border inspection station uh, and issue visas. Even scrupulously following federal standards, they couldn't do that. So applying the law that the federal government has set out is beyond their authority. And for the same reason, I believe that North Dakota couldn't hire a bunch of former uh, uh, immigration and Customs Enforcement officers and hire a bunch of former immigration judges and exactly and precisely following federal law set up deportation tribunals in the, in the interior of the state and deport people. Uh, so I think that the, that the regulation of immigration includes both setting the standards in the law and carrying them out. Uh, uh, And I believe that the Supreme Court has said that that is correct. The, the, the last point I want to make on, in terms of the definition of regulation of immigration is, is a little more controversial, um, but, but I'll, be, I'll be clear about it. Things that are equivalent to letting people in or driving people out are a regulation of immigration, constitute a regulation of immigration. And I get that from Chai Long versus Freeman, the 1876 California case uh, that the Supreme Court held was unconstitutional. The statute didn't regulate immigra immigrants at all. The statute didn't say that anybody could come or anybody had to leave. Instead, it regulated the transportation companies the, who were transporting the immigrants. And it didn't say that they could or couldn't bring anybody they wanted to. It just said, if you bring certain people, you have to post a high bond. And it didn't apply to all immigrants. It didn't apply even to uh, all Chinese. It applied to lewd and debauched women. And, and the purpose, the express purpose in the text of the law was the police power interest in having funds to pay the costs of maintaining people who were uh, liable to criminality. Uh, so it wasn't to keep them out. It was to meet the state's responsibility if they came in. And even, even with uh, all of that indirection, that level of indirection, the Supreme Court said this in practice functionally is a regulation of immigration. It's beyond state authority. So the Supreme Court has said the responsibility for the character of those regulations, that is to say immigration regulations, and for the manner of their execution belongs solely to the national government. And for that reason, I think things like the Hazleton, Pennsylvania ordinance that says if you're undocumented, you can't uh, rent or lease housing in the area. That's the equivalent, that for practical purposes, that's saying you can't be here. And so I, my argument is, for practical purposes, it's a regulation of immigration. And, uh, and, and clearly, saying that you can't be uh, concealed, harbored, transported, or shielded, and you can't be present without uh, registration documents that are impossible for you to get, for practical purposes, that's saying, don't come here or 
you go to prison. Uh, and so I regard that as a regulation of immigration. Defenders of SB 1070 try to deal with this body of doctrine by proposing that the Federal Immigration and Nationality Act, which covers this territory, invites state legislation of this character. They say that they've been asked to help out. Uh, Trilung versus Freeman makes quite clear that in the absence of federal law, states have no power to drive people out. So the argument is that the rise of federal immigration regulation in the era after Trilung versus Freeman expanded state power. It created state authority where none existed before. So now that Congress has created a category of unauthorized immigrants, states have new power. Uh, so Professor Chris Kobach, who is one of SB 1070's drafters, uh, as well as uh, a drafter of the Hazleton, Pennsylvania Ordinance, says that states and localities are impliedly authorized to pass laws and ordinances that mirror federal guidelines. The brief for uh, 80 U.S. Senators and Representatives supporting the constitutionality of SB 1070 said, Congress has passed numerous acts that welcome state involvement in immigration control. And so far as it goes, that authority is right. Uh, what Professor Kobach and what the Senators and Representatives say is true. The cases and statutes exist. The problem is that they all involve arrests. The cases involve states helping the federal government by arresting for immigration crimes. The, uh, the various provisions of the Immigration and Nationality Act authorize state and local officers to make arrests for criminal immigration violations. And what Professor Kobach and other defenders say is that this suggests that there's implied invitation on the part of the states and localities to legislate. Uh, and so the issue is whether state power to arrest for criminal immigration violations, which clearly exists to some extent, implies state power to legislate. And I argue that it does not. I think there are a number exa of examples in the law where entities have the authority and power to arrest where it's clear that they don't have legislative authority. One example is citizen's arrest. Every person uh, in most jurisdictions in the United States can make an arrest, at least for a felony, if the crime actually occurred and if there's probable cause, but that certainly doesn't Im imply that private citizens have legislative authority over other people. Another example is the National Crime Information Center, which is a computer database where warrants from all around the country are, are filed in such a way that a traffic stop, for example, in any, other in any part of the country will reveal an arrest warrant across the whole country. And what this means is, for example, that a police officer who stops somebody in Idaho uh, can make an arrest based on a warrant in Connecticut. Does that imply that Idaho has the ability to legislate uh, in Connecticut? Uh, certainly not, certainly not. There's a federal statute where state and local officers are invited to make arrests over, uh, of active duty military personnel who desert. Does that imply that, that states and localities can legislate over uh, military discipline? I, I don't, uh, of active duty U.S. armed forces. I, I, I just don't think it follows. So I think that the, that the argument of SB 1070's proponents uh, that, that the clear authorization for, uh, for supporting federal immigration policies through arrest in criminal cases implies that states are also invited to pass their own laws. I just don't think it follows. Beyond that, my reading of the text of the Immigration and Nationality Act precludes the idea that states have a legislative role. The Immigration and Nationality Act assigns enforcement to the departments of Homeland Security, Justice, and State, and gives them the ability to enact supplemental regulations. But it doesn't give anybody else uh, direct authority to enforce the act or to enact regulations. The substance of the INA 
also seems not to leave room for states to enact criminal immigration laws. The INA provides for a range of responses to the discovery of an undocumented person uh, in the United States. There's bitter and sweet. So if, if a, a, an Immigration and Customs Enforcement Officer or a Customs and Border Protection Officer finds an undocumented person, there's a range uh, with no claim, no legal claim to be in the United States, no claim that they're actually a U.S. citizen or I'm somebody, uh, you don't uh, have the right person, I actually have a green card. It's clear that they have no legal status as such. Uh, some bad things could happen to that person. They could be prosecuted for unlawfully entering the United States. They could be subject to a civil money penalty. They could be deported formally, or instead of being deported, they could be given the opportunity to voluntarily depart. And all of those things, which are ultimately designed to get the person to leave the United States, nevertheless have different legal consequences. That's the bitter part. But there's also some good things that could happen to the person. Uh, the Immigration and Nationality Act provides for things like asylum. Uh, even if they have no legal claim to be the, in the United States, maybe they can get one. There are visas uh, that will potentially be applicable to a lot of the, the group of people that we're talking about. There are visas for people who've been trafficked. There are visas for witnesses to crime. There are visas for uh, crime victims. There's also a formalized process of prosecutorial discretion called deferred action that can come with work authorization. So somebody with no claim to be in the United States uh, or that they entered the United States lawfully nevertheless might be able to stay. So with this range of responses in the, in the Immigration and Nationality Act, from prison to allowing you to stay and putting you on a path to citizenship, I, I, in my view, there's no plausible support for the idea that Congress, sub silentio, has invited the states to take one of the nine or 15 things that could happen to a person who's undocumented, and states have been invited to do that one, uh, force them to voluntarily depart essentially. Uh, uh, it just seems implausible that Congress had an unexpressed intention to share its prosecutorial discretion or the prosecutorial discretion that it granted to the executive branch with the states. An, uh, a rejoinder to that argument is how could it be that Congress doesn't want full enforcement? Why wouldn't Congress want all the help that it can get. Um, a, a superficially plausible argument, but one that I think ultimately doesn't uh, stand up to scrutiny. One fairly solid piece of evidence that, that Congress doesn't want maximum enforcement of all of the laws that it passes is the Supreme Court's skepticism about implied private rights of action. Uh, uh, frequently, the court will say, that a federal statute that's passed is solely for the administrative agencies to enforce and, and private people, uh, other people, don't have the right to uh, invoke it on their own behalf. So the court's view uh, clearly is inconsistent with the idea that maximum enforcement of all federal statutes is desirable. There's also the tradition of prosecutorial discretion. Uh, which is a critical and valuable part of the criminal justice system. Louis B. Schwartz, uh, the University of Pennsylvania law professor who wrote the model penal code with Herbert Wexler, said the paradoxical fact is that arrest, conviction, and punishment of every, every criminal would be a catastrophe. Hardly one of us would escape, for we all have at one time or another committed acts that the law regards as serious offenses. So there's 90 million adult Americans, for example, who've committed drug violations. Would it be better if all of them were convicted and imprisoned? I, I think Congress, when it passes federal uh, law, uh, is aware 
that there's not going to be in full enforcement, going to be full enforcement. Congress and the states, for that matter, don't tax and spend enough for them to contemplate that all laws will be pretty much fully enforced. They understand that prosecutors and the police are going to take certain kinds of crimes, like rape, robbery, and murder, very seriously, and other kinds of crimes, uh, uh, traffic, tax, drugs, uh, crimes associated with regulatory regimes are going to be applied and enforced in such a way as to try and achieve the regulatory goal, but not, uh, not uh, there is no moral imperative that every violator of these sorts of statutes be prosecuted. Illegal immigration is clearly a regulatory regime that Congress did not regard as particularly serious. How do we know that? Because it's classified as a petty offense. Uh, it is so trivial that one charged with illegal immigration is not necessarily entitled, is not entitled to counsel, to a jury trial, or to a trial presided over by an Article III judge. It is the same classification of offense in the federal system as speeding on a federal enclave or having a campfire on a federal enclave without permission. Uh, if a person gets a stamp, get, gets a letter in the mail with a stamp on it that has not been canceled, and they peel that stamp off and reuse it on another letter, that crime under the U.S. Code is so serious and so much more severe than illegal immigration that you do get counsel, an Article III judge, and a jury if you're accused of that. So quite deliberately, Congress has said this is a trivial offense. The reality of undocumented immigration is that the United States has always had a two-track immigration policy. It's always had legal immigration and illegal immigration. And what it has done with the illeg illegal immigration is overlook it. Between 1893 and 1986, there were six major amnesties passed by Congress, and many, 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 many smaller ones. Historically, our policy has been, if you are illegal and we catch you quickly or you commit a crime, you have to go. But if you manage to stay here for a number of years, and do what we want uh, immigrants to do. That is, don't commit crimes, work, form families, and basically be the kind of immigrant that the system is designed to bring in, we let you stay. Uh, historically, that's been the approach. Uh, I talked about Plyler versus Doe before. Most or all of the kids who were involved in that case ultimately became lawful permanent residents, many of them uh, U.S. citizens. Um, so I don't think that there's any plausible argument that Congress has in fact invited the states to do what the states and localities have done. There's no room, in my view, in the Immigration and Nationality Act for a, a separate state immigration policy that completely overrides the discretion that, uh, that Congress meant for the executive agencies to have. Nevertheless, I think it remains an important question of whether Congress could do that. Could Congress say, states, go ahead and pass your own complementary laws. Uh, we want you to do this. And so long as they don't conflict directly with, um, with the federal scheme, you can deport people. You can uh, make it a crime for undocumented people to be here. You can go your own way. And this is an, a meaningful question because, because historically, ev even after Chai Long versus Freeman, there's been this cycle of aggressive state enforcement of, immigration, of their own immigration law. The Supreme Court comes in and says it's unconstitutional, you can't do it. And then Congress comes in and does something. 
to give states more authority, to crack down on immigration itself, uh, Congress reacts because the, the political and social and economic realities that made immigration controversial at the state level don't go away just because the Supreme Court says SB 1070 is unconstitutional or state efforts to keep out the Chinese are unconstitutional. So it's perfectly possible that there will be a congressional response and that, that Congress might go ahead and ratify SB 1070. If they did, would it be constitutional? And my view is uh, I have grave doubts about it. And my argument is based on moss-covered dicta from old cases, but, but, uh, but I think that the principles are justified uh, under modern law. Now, and I'll talk about one reason. In 1816, in Martin versus Hunter's Lessee, the Supreme Court said, no part of the criminal jurisdiction of the United States can, consistently with the Constitution, be delegated to state tribunals. More recently, uh, but still some time ago, in 1920, the, the court said Congress cannot transfer its legislative, the Supreme Court said Congress cannot transfer its legislative authority to the states. By nature, this is non-delegable. So 1920 was the Lochner era. This, the, the non-delegation doctrine is in some disrepute, but I think that at least when we're talking about exclusive powers of Congress, it, it's right. Uh, so in Clinton versus New York, uh, 1998 case holding the line item veto unconstitutional, the sixth justice majority said that Congress could not delegate lawmaking authority or its functional equivalent to the president. The fact that Congress intended such a result is of no moment. And in DeConnus versus Bika, a 1976 uh, case decided unanimously uh, in an opinion by Justice Brennan, the court refers to a constitutionally proscribed regulation of immigration that Congress itself would be powerless to authorize or approve. So in, in 1976, at least, every member of the court thought if we're talking about the actual regulation of immigration, even Congress can't allow the states to do it. Um, um, is another reason that I'll talk about just for 60 seconds and then I would uh, love to hear some questions if anybody has any. Uh, the, the, the other structural problem with inviting the states to get into this uh, and uh, to regulate immigration is that it would violate separation of powers because it would take away from the president's authority to take care that the laws are executed. In Prince versus United States, the uh, the, the Brady uh, Act case, Justice Scalia struck down the, the effort on the part of Congress to have the state law enforcement authorities help carry out the Brady Act for two reasons. The, the more famous reason is because states can't be commandeered under the Tenth Amendment, according to Justice Scalia and the other members of the majority. The second reason is because it interfered with the president's prerogative to carry out federal law. And uh, the court there said, the Constitution does not leave it to speculation who is to administer the laws enacted by Congress. The president, it says, shall take care that the laws should be faithfully executed. Uh, the court said that, it was in, that the Brady Act was invalid because it effectively transfers this power to thousands of law enforcement officers in the 50 states who are left to implement the program without meaningful presidential control, if indeed meaningful presidential control is possible without the power to appoint and remove. So even conservative justices, I think, I don't think that the Supreme Court is going to save SB 1070 from the Ninth Circuit because conservative justices are going to be, at least Justice Scalia, is going to be skeptical of the idea that uh, Congress can get around uh, federal executive authority that is doing something that it doesn't like simply by transferring federal power to the states. So uh, I, I have a lot more to say, and I, I don't know how much time we have, but it's, but it's 5.20, and uh, I would love to hear some questions.
Well, you know, these, these, if, if, this, if the next amnesty is like the last amnesties, it's basically for people who are still here. I mean, the, if people are unlucky enough to get caught and deported, then, um, then they're out. I mean, it's a, these amnesties are sort of problem-solving amnesties. You know, they're not designed to resolve all of the moral questions and all the fairness questions. They're, they sort of say, look, these people are here. We can't break up the families. But if the families are already broken up, then traditionally they have not reached out and brought people back. That's right, that's right, that's right. So the, f the, the federal government has established a set of prosecutorial priorities, you know, formalized prosecutorial discretion, and Customs and Border Protection and ICE officers are supposed to focus on certain kinds of undocumented people, namely so-called criminal aliens and recent border crossers. It doesn't, they, they don't want to allow people to build up equities in the United States because if they do, they know that it's going to be harder to deport them. Um, you know, and so, so the problem is that state and local officers are not bound by these prosecutorial discretion guidelines. So they can arrest, if, if they can do what SB 1070 says they can do, uh, the federal government can have one policy and the states can have a policy that's completely different from that and that's, that's uh, a problem if you believe that it's that it, at least it's primarily a federal responsibility and a federal role. I, th I think I, I think what's going on now is a, is a, is a very unfortunate episode, and, and I think my personal view is that it's associated with, with racism and other ugly qualities. However, having said that, this episode is less severe than some of the ones in the past for a couple of reasons. One, we don't have riots. We don't have anti-immigrant riots, which are a feature of previous decades. Uh, the other thing that's sort of amazing to me is we have no serious push to cut legal immigration, uh, which, which has often been part of economic downturns and waves of nativism in the past. Legal immigration gets cut off. And I think, I think it's a, a measure of progress, certainly not complete progress, but some progress, that, that that's off the table. Everybody understands we need immigration. Uh, and, it, and it's put in terms of what I think is sort of phony, uh, rule of law, law and order. Um, you know, I'm, I'm all in favor of that, but we don't have a goal of full enforcement of the law. So, so I, you know, I, I think it's, um, it's maybe in some ways not quite as bad as the ones in the past. Is Congress going to do anything? Um, I guess I don't see it on the horizon, right? I don't see anything in the immediate future that suggests that that's going to happen. And, and you know, um, one, of the, one of the drafters of SB 1070 uh, explained it to me um, that, that the groups that want comprehensive immigration reform, big business, the civil rights community, and the Latino community. They all want comprehensive immigration reform, 
but they want it to have very different features. And, and in the civil rights community, I include the unions. Uh, so for example, the civil rights community wants robust labor protection. The big business communities, that's not really a huge priority for them. Um, and so what, so far, what, what opponents of comprehension of immigration reform have been able to accomplish is, you know, is dividing the people who otherwise might be in favor of it. You know, wh how that changes, I don't know. So, so I think that, I think there can be, the president has the ability, the president and the cabinet secretaries have the ability to mitigate some of this to some degree, you know. Couldn't get the DREAM Act passed, but they can put DREAMers, uh, uh, undocumented youth who basically grew up in the United States and don't have criminal records and were educated in the United States, they can put them at the bottom of the priority list for, for deportation, which for the moment makes them safe. It's not the same as legalization because they don't necessarily have work authorization and it can be taken away at any time. But, but there, are, there are a lot of things that, that the executive can do under the law as it exists today to, um, to mitigate the lack of of comprehensive immigration reform by statute, but it's it, but it's all going to be workarounds. Uh, it, it's going to be mitigation. Ultimately, I don't think that there's going to be a real solution until Congress acts. No, I, I, think, I think some of it is going to turn on preemption. And some of it is going to turn on whether it's a regulation. I mean, all of it, the fir initial categorization question is, are these things regulations of immigration or not? And my view is that, that saying that you have to ha follow the federal registration laws is a regulation of immigration. It's direct control and enforcement of the immigration system. Uh, and the transportation concealing, harboring, and shielding is direct control of the process of immigration. Uh, and so I think that's a regulation of immigration, just like saying you can't rent an apartment because that means you can't be present. So some of these things are going to turn on, uh, you know, if we say that you can't, that states can't directly regulate immigration, then it also has to be true that they can't do things that are the same as regulating immigration in the guise of, so you could say, well, you can't kick them out, but you can say that it's a capital offense to use our public works. So if you step on the sidewalk, it's clearly have regulatory authority over the sidewalks, over the, the, the highways, and if an undocumented non-citizen sets foot on them, then they're guilty of a, of a crime well, that's regulating immigration for practical purposes. The, if, uh, on the other hand, you know, nobody doubts that if an undocumented non-citizen commits burglary, they can be prosecuted for burglary. Uh, and, and it's w where do you draw the line? Part of the reason that line drawing in a lot of these cases isn't going to be so difficult is the confession in Section 1 where they say the purpose of this is to regulate immigration. But the other part is, you know, I mean, we know from civil rights cases that things as, as race neutral as where we put the roads and where we put the dumps can, can in reality be racial classifications. Um, but all of these statutes, again, even leaving aside the confession in section one, the purpose clause, 
they use the classifications. Uh, they're driven by uh, undocumented status. And um, I, I think they're going to have a hard time in, in some of these instances saying that this is, this is about police power as opposed to just trying to get rid of these people. Because, because uh, saying that Deconis versus Bika upheld a California prohibition on undocumented non-citizens working. And they said that that wasn't a regulation of immigration because they said there that the purpose was to protect the economy and they said a remote and speculative effect on immigration wouldn't, um, wouldn't constitute a regulation of immigration, remote and speculative. Um, and the reality is that 80 percent of undocumented people are in mixed families. And so the reality is that it's perfectly possible for <coughs> an undocumented person to be in the United States without working. Dreamers, you're, you know, you're in ninth grade, you know, your parents are working, you don't need to work. Uh, and many people are married, many undocumented people are married to lawful permanent residents and, um, and uh, or U.S. citizens. And so, uh, as, a, as a, it's difficult to be in the United States without the ability to work, but it's not impossible. It's impossible to, uh, uh, to, be in Arizona and have a registration card that you can't get. Um, it, it's literally not possible. You either have to not go into the state or violate the law. Now, based on that analysis, I admit that the Hazleton residence requirement, it, it's, it's not zero, right? It's not impossible uh, to, um, but to live in Hazleton without the ability to rent or lease. You know, you can sleep under a tree, you can sleep in a car. But, but I think for practical purposes, it, it is very, my argument would be, it's very close to saying that it's Ill, that you can't be in, this, in the state. Well, on, this, on, this, uh, on the second one, I think organized labor ultimately has come to the conclusion that they're best, that, that they're pro-immigration and pro-legalization, and that's best for their members in the long run. Um, on, on the first one, yeah, I, I think immigration is not unique, but it's one of those, it, it's like um, regulation of the active duty armed forces or uh, uh, treaties. It is, for practical purposes, at least according to the precedents as I understand them, uh, walled off from the states, at least when we're talking about who can come in and who has to leave and the procedures for that. Uh, you know, there are lots of areas that are, that are sh uh, matters of shared jurisdiction. Uh, securities, labor, even uh, commerce, employment, these are things that the state has uh, legitimate police power interests in. Um, but, but with regard to immigration, uh, it's hard for me to see the, 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 the state interest 
other than the interest in them leaving, which is the immigration interest, which is the federal interest. Other than that, uh, uh, it's hard for me to see what their claim is. I mean, they can already, if they commit crimes, they can punish them. They can deny them most benefits. In fact, federal law requires that undocumented people be denied most state benefits. So, you know, so it's not those, those things which are covered by other law. It's their presence. And that, you know, is, is, is the ex exclusive federal interest as I understand it. I better call on Dean Amos. Yeah. My view, and it's just my view, is that uh, that so racial racial anxiety is part of it. Um, um, Arizona is, as uh, Senator John McCain has said, is rapidly becoming Hispanic. It used to be uh, 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 not the case. Now, 30 percent of the state is uh, of Mexican ancestry, uh, and it's the most rapidly growing demographic group. Uh, things are changing there politically uh, and in other ways. And um, I think it is making some people uncomfortable. Um, you, you know, there's a, there's a fairly signi significant correlation between, um, between, you know, being a, a part of the former Confederacy as Arizona was, and uh, enthusiasm for these SB 1070 type uh, type laws. I mean, I'm, I'm wondering if, I'm trying to think if there's one state that didn't have a anti-miscegenation law that's passed an SB 1070 type law. Uh, and uh, maybe in, uh, I, 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 Indiana, I believe, had an anti-miscegenation law. It's a, uh, so, you know, I think it's, it's part of a political cultural tradition in these states.
Well, on that issue, it reminds me of something that I heard a Catholic archbishop say in response to uh, a proposal to enact an SB 1070 type law in his state, and he was against it, and he said, let's not do damage to the community that we won't be able to undo in the future. And uh, I, I think, um, you know, that, that these sorts of things will cause rifts uh, and, and pain that, um, that will leave scars for a long time. Other questions? I think that one is going to turn on preemption, and, uh, and there's a federal statute that says that state and local officers can cooperate with the Attorney General in the investigation, apprehension, detention, and removal of, of, uh, of undocumented aliens. Cooperate with the Attorney General. And the Attorney General has said, stop doing this. Uh, and so I, I don't think that that can plausibly be characterized as uh, cooperation. However, uh, another piece of this is that racial profiling is not uh, at issue here because in a case called United States versus Brignoni Ponce, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court unanimously, uh, in a Brennan opinion, if I'm remembering correctly, said that in the immigration enforcement context, the likelihood that any given person of apparent Mexican ancestry is an alien is high enough that that can be a factor in stopping them. Uh, so in the immigration context, racial profiling is legal. Um, and whether that will apply to state law enforcement officers too, there's an argument that it shouldn't, but at, at least as to federal authorities, racial profiling is legal. There's no issue of that in the case as it is now. <laughs>